Um, and I think Yari has kind of slides. Um, do you want to pop the agenda slide there, Yari? Did you get that? Uh, no. Do you want to put, move on to the agenda slide, Yari? Yes, I am on the agenda slide. How do we get the rest of you on the agenda slide? Ah, I can I can see the agenda there. slides, Robin here. Yeah. Okay, I don't, but never mind. Okay, so uh, Yari has the agenda slide. I have it in another window. Um, does, does that agenda look okay to people? Do you want to back the agenda in way? Okay. Take that as this agenda works. Um, and I think that's the introduction I had. Uh, if there's no agenda, then Yari can go on to point two. And the okay, so Yari, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. So uh, we um, have been discussing exactly how to um, progress this work um, in terms of organization. And I don't want to take up too much time at the top of the call for this part, because we have some actual technical stuff to discuss. That's more interesting. Um, but we would like to get organized slightly more than we are. And sort of currently, the, the situation is that we have this very informal way of working, which is, I think, great and exactly matches this situation. Um, that we need to explore a little bit, like, what should we do? Uh, we also have open collaboration, which is, um, of course, uh, exactly correct uh, for IT uh, activities. We don't have so much document structure at the moment, uh, which is good for now, uh, because we are exploring again. Uh, we don't have so much in terms of plans going forward. Um, you know, maybe it would be good to have a little bit of that, uh, although obviously document structure and so on will, will tell us uh, more later. Um, we've also observed that not everyone is aware of activities, like people who we actually wanted to join this effort were not aware of the meetings and so forth, uh, which is kind of bad. Um, and it's also been a little unclear, like who should call for the meetings and, uh, and so on, all the practical stuff. It's uh, maybe a little bit bad as well. And uh, Steve and I have discussed this, and um, and we also discussed with the IAB, and it basically seemed to us that work should continue in this exploration mode uh, and informally for now. But we would like to have some organization, um, you know, whether that's a working group, work item in a working group, slot in IAB program, something else. Um, but it, if we had something like that, then the practicalities would take care of themselves a little bit better and would be maybe visible in some agenda somewhere and um, more people would be aware of what's going on and could join if they wanted to. And um, we don't, or at least I, I don't, I don't think Stephen has either very strong opinions exactly how to go about this, this uh, lightweight organization thing. Um, but uh, we do know that since both of us are in the IAB, it would be relatively easy for us to create uh, a new IAB program. And since this seems a little bit like an architecture thing that things are changing in the world, and uh, maybe we should highlight that, that seemed like uh, one possible answer. And so we circulated, as you remember, uh, a, a charter, um, which we modified slightly based on, on feedback. Um, there's a link on the slide, if you can see my slides now, I don't know, but uh, there's a link um, to the GitHub page with the full chapter. I don't want to show the whole thing here on the slide, but I have a slightly abbreviated version just to go through um, the main points. So the idea here is to have an IAP program, a new IAP program that will be an open venue analysis of the threat model uh, situation, and it would produce a potential update to ECP 72 um, that would better match the reality today as we see it. Of course, 
since we would be an IAB program, we cannot dictate and don't want to dictate anything what the IETF does. So we would only figure out like this is the background why we believe a change is needed. And here's a suggestion, and then that would be taken up by by IETF, uh, pro probably modified and and so on. Um, and a um, couple of other points. So obviously, if we want to update this um, this aspect in PCP seventy two, this is kind of like a detail in in, in the you know longer document, uh, and there isn't a lot of space for things to be discussed. So if we want to do uh, you know a lengthy description of of situation or analysis, then that's probably a separate document. So we might produce also background materials. Um, and of course, since we are talking about things like do we trust these or those endpoints, there's probably going to be different trade-offs in different people's minds. And the idea here is not to dictate that the idea forever will prefer, you know, these endpoints over others or whatever silly thing that some, somebody might think. But rather, it's just to uh, call attention to for the protocol designers that hey, you have to think about these things. We're not the ones to um, arbit, uh, like arbiter for uh, for decisions. So like, what's what's more important, this or that? But uh, one has to consider uh, these things as well as as some things in, in protocol design. And I, I would hope that there's interest in this, you know, regardless of your particular perspective on some trade-offs. That there's interest in noting that this is a, a consideration. Um, and one final thing about the sort of practical things. So this would be indeed an open program, open to all interested parties. Not all IAB programs have been like that, um, but this this would need to be like we are currently. And we have a mailing list, as you know. We would announce our meetings publicly. Uh, we would only do this for six months at the beginning. This is not supposed to be a, like a forever uh, program. And then the expected outputs, basically, this potential suggestion for the IETF uh, for a change, and then some supporting supporting documents. Uh, I don't know if Stephen, you want to add anything to the proposal at this point? No, that's fine. I see Robin has a, a hand up. I think so. Maybe has something to say. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Ari. Um, yes, it was just a quick comment because um, uh, Yari used the word trust, um, which is which is fine. Um, it it always rings a small bell um, when I hear it. You know, do we trust this endpoint? Um, because at some point in the document, uh, we will have to make clear, and, and to be fair, it may already exist. We will have to make clear what we mean by um, by trust there, um, and, and usually it's simply a matter of completing the phrase. Um, we trust or don't trust this endpoint to do X. Um, and, and once you get to that point, then you've got a workable definition. But if it's just trust as an as an uncompleted predicate, then um, it's hard to get anything. It's hard to get anything actionable out of it. Yeah, I think that's a very valid comment, and I may have um, uh, spoken uh, carelessly and uh, possibly also written carelessly. One could imagine perhaps that you can you can write the purpose of this exercise without using the word trust because the point really isn't <laughs> like who do we who do we trust but ra rather that you have to consider the possibility that there's a an issue in in the other side or or even in your implementation and so on so uh, alerting people to that fact rather than sort of trying to uh, be the arbiter for you know, trust the guys versus those other guys. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is the reason I think there's probably wording in there that, that there may well be wording in there that does this already is that this is not new in the security domain. If you say that something is secure, that's useless, but you have to say. Yeah, I'm sorry, is the, is the idea that agents misbehave somehow supposed to be news? Sorry, could you repeat? I missed that. Yeah, I, I said, I'm finding this discussion a little puzzling. Is the idea that, that agents in the network misbehave supposed to be somehow news? 
No, no. It, I think it's no, not, not not news. But if we are if we're trying to describe a threat model, and we're couching it in terms of, for instance, um, a reduction in the extent to which we feel we can trust endpoints. Um, all I'm saying is that we should probably specify what it is that we are trusting endpoints to do or not do. And that may be as general a statement as um, this endpoint cannot be trusted to uh, to fulfill the function you expect of it. Well, and I certainly agree that trust is a relative relation, but I guess I'm going back to the I'm going back I guess I'm going back to the the purpose of this extra giant exercise, um, which has been going on for quite some time now, um, which is to update the threat model in some way that it previously was inadequate. I'm trying to understand in what way this is supposed to be like, 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 much, like, like I've heard a lot of talk about how, like, somehow the situation is different and then points are less trustworthy. And I'm trying to figure out what is supposed to be news in this conversation. Yeah, I don't think I'm what pointing. What is the new information to, that was not was not available to us 15 years ago? I, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm pointing to a new problem. Uh, I'm. I'm just mm -hmm. observing no, but I'm that, that the effort is predicated in the idea there is one. Okay, in in that case, so, I think. Hey, hey, Tangential Hicker, to the point I, I was making. Hicker, I don't. I don't. We're saying that there's a new problem per se. I mean, in theory, all of this is well known. But um, I, I think there's a new situation in in the sense that uh, perhaps in the past, uh, getting communication security right was, uh, you know, um, hugely important. Now, when that's in a lot of cases, it's, it's much better handled. And we have some other issues to tackle and uh, alerting people to the fact that, hey, in protocol design, you also have to consider these these aspects. Um, that That's the what base trying we're to get, trying to deal yeah. with here. I guess what I'm trying to get is what are those aspects? From my perspective, that that's the question of, you know, what kind of uh, threats arise on, uh, from endpoints that uh, may misbehave for uh, one or other reason. Oh, that, 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 this is gets back to my question, which is like, I mean, I've been this a long time, and so have you. And like, the idea that like there's malware in people's computers is like not news. It's like goes back to like, I mean, like any, how old any virus? How old is a Morris worm? So again, like, what's the news? I, Personal opinion is that the current text in 3552 uh, sort of seems to discourage the you know, thinking too much uh, in, into uh, the th these issues, and I would rather change that text. I, I'm not asking for a huge change. I also recognize that you, like you commented on the mailing list, I think recently that there are other other topics that you would like to change in 3552 if, if you had a chance. Um, not suggesting that those would not be sensible changes either, but, but I, I, I do well, think I, that I the guess, current emphasis could, could perhaps be changed. So, okay, well, so I guess I'd like to understand what people think that means, because, like, I think the text there is correct, which is to say that the situation is essentially hopeless when endpoint is compromised. And, um, and so, like, I guess, I, I feel like this has been going on for quite some time, and I've heard this argument made, right, made by you or other people a number of times. I'm trying to understand what actual text change you want to make, because, like, if you think that text is incorrect, now let's understand how. And if you think that text should be like, oh, well, endpoints actually are compromised a lot more than you think, I, I, okay, fine. But, like, um, like, what is the actual change you want to make? Well, I do think that there are things to do. It's not entirely hopeless. And uh, secondly, we do have text proposals. Actually, I, we, we could get to that at some point on this call also. Um, and I also sent some so, additional okay. texts just before the call. I agree that the assumption that like every that you have just to assume that every endpoint is completely compromised is not how we design protocols today. We have different roles where we have different trust in the entities, and that's not reflected in the current document. I, I, don't, I just don't agree with that statement. Um, like we don't assume the endpoints are completely compromised. What I said was that the idea that there are degrees of compromise is not actually like really that commensurate with the way protocol design proceeds. Um, that typically, that what we said to which we were to be compromised is temporality. Um, um, like, yes, PCS, and then I guess very occasionally we worry about things like chaos filtration versus non chaos filtration. Um, but, like, 
these are like, like, I mean, this is getting very deep into like, and that's a very deep technical, like, Comsec stuff. Um, is that, is those the changes you want to make? Do you want to talk about KSL? Do you want to talk about KSL? you want to talk about PCS and, P, and PFS? Like, what are the changes you want to make? So, Eric, um, I think there are, I, I do think there are changes that could be beneficial. I don't think we know what they are yet. And I think that's okay. Uh, it sounds a bit like you're, you're looking for the results before we've done the kind of analysis together. Well, I, I, well, I, I, sure. I guess I'm, I guess I'm surprised that we've gotten this far with the claim that, that a bunch of changes need to be made without having a clear idea what the changes, a clear proposal what the changes are. Again, we we have text proposals from several people, but um, you know maybe they're not the right ones, and, and that's why we're having this discussion. Let me it's not like we we have a blank sheet of paper. Yeah, I, I think we could make proposals that would fill tens of pages of text, but I don't think that would be useful. So I think the challenge for me, it seems, is to try and see is there something that we can reduce and make it generic enough that it would be useful. But I I have I don't think there's a problem with saying that there are, you could add an awful lot more to that one paragraph that's in BCP seventy two today. No, I agree. You could like incorporate like all Schneider. Um, um, I agree with that. Right. So I, th I think the challenge for this group is: can we condense into something useful as an update to BCP seventy two? And I, I don't think we know the answer is yes or no yet, personally. I actually did send at the top of the call um, a proposal for three different options, like you know this very minimal thing, essentially a single sentence and another chain or that and some additional things, or a very lengthy guideline about stuff like like some some of the things that you talked about, Ecker, um, and so forth. But uh, I, I'm more on the minimal side personally. But we have also and quite far from the original topic of, of this first uh, section of the agenda, which was about the organization. Um, if we get back to that um, for a brief moment, so we wanted to get, uh, I mean, there's also already been some discussion on the mailing list. I uh, would like to get your feedback today. If you think our plan is acceptable or crazy, um, and if the, if the model is somehow acceptable, then Stephen and I uh, can, um, work with the IAB to figure out how to create a program. And uh, we have, in the meantime, also requested a meeting time in Vancouver for an hour or a half. Feedback on whether that's a suitable thing to do would also be useful and the length of time. Um, any comments on that at this point? So, um, hi, this is um, Dirk. Um, so, in general, I think it, it would be good to have that program, but um, I also have to agree to um, Eka to some extent that um, it may actually not be optimal um, to focus um, this activity so much on updating BCP 72, um, because I think, I think the, the discussion has shown that um, most of the threats that people seem to have in mind have little to do with communication security, for example, and, and um, the other objectives uh, in BCP 72, um, because the threats are mostly um, about endpoints that behave perfectly fine um, regarding communication security. They're just not doing what the user expects. And this is probably really difficult to capture in uh, BCP 72-like text. Um, so I'm not, um, say, 100% negative that we cannot come up with something useful, but um, I, I think it could be productive to first articulate those threats more and, um, you know, make, make the goal of, uh, of, the, of this effort finding out um, whether there's something useful that we, we can add uh, to BCP72. Um, and I think that's uh, largely the plan and maybe there's been too much emphasis on on, on the uh, words on on the update um, I think the analysis part is is equally important um, but I think that like to the core of the question I I, I mean of course the situation is that you have to consider non-coms comsec issues that that, that is the 
the primary advice at a high level. Well, I mean, I mean so, so I guess like maybe it's maybe, maybe helpful to actually think of an example um, that is not this sort of endpoint one, which is from my perspective, probably the major, like the major change in the environment um, in the past 10 years has been the, has been the sort of the rise of commercial surveillance via web tracking. That's probably the biggest like unanticipated change that we didn't understand that even when you understand like the Dole Dion model, like it's not what you would have, you would not have realized that was going to happen. And like, I think that would be a really good material to like cover. What would we say about that? Oh, I, I won't try and, kind of thing. I won't try and give a complete answer uh, to that, but I think one of the things we could say is that people should be considering abuse cases when designing protocols in the IETF. Not just use cases, but abuse cases. Okay. Not cover the abuse cases currently sufficiently, uh, Stephen? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think in general, thinking of the, the specific threat Ecker mentioned, um, we tend to define protocols with extensibility points, and we think of how to make them work for the, the two or three use cases that the IETF working group is focused on. And then it turns out that somebody figures a way of abusing these protocol data units uh, for tracking or for correlating or re-identifying. And we hadn't thought about those kind of abuse cases uh, at protocol design time. So I, I, I think... It, I think that particular change is one that seems attractive to me now. Whether it, if we thought it through some more, whether it would pan out to be something actually useful enough to put into an update, I don't know. But I think that's something to explore. So I would actually suggest that you know, in, in a previous conversation, and, and I apologize, I don't remember whether it was in this group or a different group, we, we described this as uh, the current description is of an omnipotent attacker We've gotten to the point, both on the commercial side and with uh, kind of the per pass stuff, of realizing that some of these attackers are also omnipresent. And so our our sense of what's actually uh, going uh, to the attacker has to be updated um, <clears throat> with an understanding that they may be cross-correlating uh, data uh, visible uh, um, only across many different flows. So. If you think about the communication security on a per flow basis, uh, you'll be missing this class of attacks. Um, and I think that's uh, something that we, we definitely can explore. Um, and I think it, it's very difficult in that situation to, to think about what the abuse is because the, the attack itself is the, the data leakage. And then what somebody does with the attack uh, is the, the abuse and I think that's or what somebody does with leaked data is the abuse so I think there's a there's a piece here where if we can describe the results of this new piece of information about the attacker uh, it may help people think through what the abuse cases are uh, and it may change what we put in individual flows so the problem then is uh, the not just that endpoints are compromised, but in some cases you need to communicate with an endpoint that may in some respects be hostile. Because the cross, because yeah. the cross correlation is, is happening largely by, you know, maybe e-commerce sites or, or, or things that you're, that you're communicating with. So that's certainly one class of these where the the uh, omnipresence is achieved by collusion, uh, but there are other classes of them where it's achieved in other ways. Ted, I'm, I, mean, I guess I mean, maybe the difference here is to make this point as sharp as it should be, but should be, but like, you know, the dual via threat model assumes like complete access to the network everywhere on the network. So like, I mean, this is like not. I mean, again, like I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand like how much people think the situation has changed, or how much people think the tech is not good, versus how much people think of like the material that we now we have to cover. Like those are like all these different things. And like I, I guess maybe you know, you, we you and I had a conversation previously. We were sure like, well, that wasn't obvious to everybody, but like that seems like sort of like like I feel like that's generally obvious to the communication security community. Um, um, but you know, maybe, maybe it's a matter of being dark clear. 
I mean, the web tracking thing is a different be... example. Go ahead. So, so I think it might, might actually be useful at some point to get, get the actual text proposals also uh, as, as examples at least. Um, so discussing this in the abstract may be difficult. So I think the, the theory thing, hasn't right? changed. So that's why I said with the web tracking thing, right? Because I mean, like, one could imagine writing like a page and a half about like how web tracking works and how that's a privacy threat and like how you have to think about that and reason about that when you're building systems. And like that would be like a very appropriate like piece of material for someone. <laughs> for, for, for someone in some forum, I'm trying to figure out the field, that be appropriate material for this forum, because um, that will help me guide my thinking. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that that's a topic and other similar things that, that could be dealt in an analysis document. I think there might be some people who think that we should put a lot of material in, you know, 3552 type document. I'm not one of those persons. I, I, I only want to change the emphasis there a little bit. It seems to discourage currently um, some of the avenues for for issues, um, and I'd like to change that personally. Uh, but if if I try to summarize the discussion on the organization piece, then I didn't hear a lot of objection for this IAB path. Uh, I did hear a discussion about like, what do we focus on on the analysis and gathering data and uh, advice and so on versus this 3552 thing. Um, and that's, that's of course fair game for discussion. So maybe if, unless somebody screams, uh, the, the organization part, uh, go ahead. And then we would actually move forward in this, this call to the technical discussion, which we in practice have already been having. So, uh, Steven, how, how would you like to continue the, that part? Uh, I guess uh, hmm. yeah, if you go to the slide that says the kind of expected outputs from the program text. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think um, Ecker, are you just on on phone or can you also see the screen? I can see the screen. I'm just on the phone for tech, for technical reasons. Right. So, uh, I, I guess the expected outputs. So we had we talked a bit about possible updates to BCP seventy two. I think other documents, perhaps on the nature of the kind of one you mentioned about web tracking, could be good outputs. And whether we would produce RFCs or just internet drafts that, that that wither away, that kind of justify or try to explain or explore threat models. Um, I think. There's, you know, there's scope there for um, explanatory kind of material that would be just too verbose and too specific for PCP 72. Um, and that's like most of the text in the, the draft Gary and I wrote. Uh, I, so I guess I'd like to ask, do, do, do people feel that they would work on these kind of outputs? And when we asked that in Vancouver, a bunch of people said yes. and. The holidays happened, and not much uh, happened on this topic. Uh, so, it, it, is this a reasonable set of things on which to try and get us to work? Uh, and, and again, just another point is I think, as a kind of a mode of operation, I think it would be entirely fine for people to just work independently. And later on, we can see how much the commonality there is and whether documents should be merged or whatever. I don't think we should be trying to just work on one document uh, at this point. Does that set of expected outputs look like a useful thing? Is my question. Well, I mean, I guess the resistance you're hearing from me, Stephen, is this things are really focused on this sort of like BCP seventy two and new threat model question, and like, but I don't see, but I don't see, like that seems, but then you, I just got told that like the thing I think is most interesting, which is like actually explaining what the implications are in the current environment, is like not in scope for that discussion. So like, so like, no, I don't think this is. I think I think focusing on updates of seventy two is like the most important thing. Is the wrong thing. I think the right thing to do is focus on actually describing the threat environment, and that includes not just threat model, but also what people are actually doing in the world. And um, and, and then once we've done that, we can determine whether or not some updates of seventy two is required. Okay, no, I, I don't have a problem with that. But so that suggests like rewording at least that last bullet in, to say, you know, to say not explaining new threat models, but the threat environment and possible new threat models, maybe.
Well, I guess, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm sort of like, I mean, do, do you think web tracking is a change in the front office? Sorry, say again. Do you think web tracking is a change in the threat model? Yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's helpful because because I wasn't sure that was true. Um, now, I mean, you could, you know, it's, it's a pause. Then yes, yes. <laughs> so I, you know, I think web tracking at the scale and across the number of applications and platforms and so on as it happens today is not even hinted at by the current threat model. Oh, I 100% agree. I 100% agree. I, 100% agree. Um, I, I think there's more to be said. Whether it, you know, to, to what extent uh, you cast as a new threat model, I don't know. But yeah, I think there's definitely more to be said. Yeah, I think that came out, uh, certainly, I, I have a vague recollection that came out in the discussion in um, in Singapore. Uh, in connection also with the the, um, the threat resident represented by linkability um, I think I think those surface at the same time in the discussion so this is all beginning to sound to me like a um, you know listening to all the the issues and complaints and and you know it sounds almost like a program that, that a lot of people think is too big and I think that one of the easiest ways around that would be to structure the charter or whatever we call the program text such that it really becomes sort of a phased type approach right if, if you want to concentrate on uh let's define the environment first and then come back and figure out how to update you know bcp 72 with with a model afterwards i think that sounds like a really good approach but i would structure the bullets uh that way so that we walk through stuff and maybe include an example and you know if the, if the web-based example is, is a good one to start thinking about include uh, that is a as a such as to try and get a more structured flow. I mean the the meeting in Singapore was great, but it was all over the map too, and and that's the thing I worry about this program. Um, okay, and and then yeah, so, go ahead. I, yeah, I, mean, I, I I guess my perspective of what's happened is that like. Like, you know, we have sort of a set of, we have a set of, uh, uh, of, you know, underlying assumptions that, you know, people have historically made about the way that, like, you have to reason about security. And then two things have happened. One is that the operating environment in which those assumptions have to be applied, like, change radically from 135 to 2 is written, both in terms of, you know, the, the rise of the web and the rise of cloud computing and decentralized, decentralized operation, or I guess maybe centralized, but, 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 but distributed the same, you know, the way AWS is. Um, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is we've got a much clearer understanding of how to actually reason about the security properties and systems from those first principles. And that goes back to like, you know, things like PC, PFS, which is like barely understood when this is written, and PCS, which is like not understood at all when this is written, and things like append only logs, and like just how to reason about those things. So I think those are the two things from my perspective that really changed. And like actually, like, you know, whether you call a threat model or not, really, really could do with some explanation, but they're clearly, they're clearly not present in the too. <laughs> um, I mean, it weren't even contemplated. So for my job, those are the things that like, I would like, if we're gonna do something, I would most like to see get out on the table because those would actually be helpful to people reading it might be like, hey, you know, now you're like designing a protocol, like you should be thinking of these things, which like we didn't really understand you guys to think about back then. Um, I'm certainly willing to read text on some of those, but some of those things, I do think those are valuable. Cause I think, I think those are certainly like, you know, I mean, new protocols are entertaining to me. And was like, hey, I want to start designing concept protocols. Yeah, it would be like, these are things that you actually have to know. <laughs> but maybe those are boring, in which case I won't do anything. Well, Eckert, did I hear you volunteering to do something there? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be, I'd be willing to, the two things I'm willing to do is I'm willing to write up like, I'm going to write some material on like web tracking, a page or two, and I'm going to write up a page or two, um, though I'm actually going to try to draft Chris to help me with this, um, on, you know, sort of like modern reasoning about protocol security, um, especially based on things like endpoint compromise, but also based on thinking about like, you know, um, you know, how, how we like, how we reason about what the statements we want to make about security are. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty clear, like, I mean, just to elaborate on that for one second, it's like really clear, like the way we designed 
TLS 1.3 and the way we design the MLS, like radically different from the way that like, you know, SW3 or SM9 were designed. And they come out by different principles and different kinds of those operation. And those are things people people will benefit from knowing. So I'm like, I'm willing to like write, you know, a total of basically three pages of material on those two topics that people think those are valuable. Um, if they're not valuable, I'm happy to not reflect them on you. <laughs> I would find that extremely valuable. Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay. Okay. Well, then I will, I, I will attempt to prove something. <laughs> Uh, okay, and, and then just trying to broaden it out a bit. I mean, who who else on the call uh, who was either at the meeting in Vancouver or not, or sorry, in Singapore, uh, or not or wasn't, uh, thinks that they would be able to work on something along these lines? Let's say between now and Vancouver, noting that the the deadline for internet drafts is March 9th. I can help Becker with that. That was Chris. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, Robin says, does work on e review or comment? Uh, I'm assuming everybody would comment probably, but uh, more I'm more assuming asking who would uh, write text or update drafts. Uh, so I think, yeah, Yardi's put up the a list of the things that we said in Singapore. Um, I, I think it'd be good to know how many of these might be updated between now and Vancouver. Dominique says yes, I will. I assume you mean update your draft. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hi, uh, this is Ali. Um, uh, indeed, uh, we will uh, work on uh, collating some data uh, of the threats and just to be able to provide a basis for examples. Uh, if a certain things could have been in the recommendations, protocols could have patched up some holes that uh, existed uh, current uh, specifications. So I'll work on that. And if people can throw uh, examples, uh, then it would be uh, also good. So I just noticed that Ali, uh, the, the, the... The slide says CDE. I think the, the, I think what you were planning to do was have a look at CVEs and see which ones would be relevant in the IETF context. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so if you're looking at the the, the slide, it's, it's at a CDE. It should be CVE. No, no. Yes, uh, I think uh, we corrected that with Robin, but maybe it didn't. Uh, yeah, indeed, CDE. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't take the. I took the original one. Thank you. So we had that. So uh, there's. Did somebody take a note of all of those volunteering actions in the minutes? Or Robin, are you doing that now? Or? No, I don't think I was. Um, I I just oh. done. I think I think I captured Eka's um three two or three points in the chat. So, so uh, if whoever is helping with the uh, anonymously helping with the Etherpad minutes could try and capture who volunteered for what, that'd be great. So, uh, what I heard was from Mark, Dominic, Ali, and um, Robin. Did I? I didn't hear anything from Melinda or Karsten. Did I miss somebody? Sure. Um, he was already in the in the Etherpad. I don't think I don't think Melinda's on the call. Ted, there's a note from Mark McFadden in the chat. He says he'll work on updating the class on endpoint taxonomy before Vancouver. Thank you. Oh, Yari, you had, uh, if you go back to the agenda, I guess, um, uh, so we, Yari and I had updated the draft we wrote. Um, just out of interest, has anybody had a chance to look at that? I, we, I did get some comments about typos and stuff, but uh, it's not hugely different. It's, it's, it's definitely fairly flaky in places, um, but if there's any comments on it that, or anything's people, anything in there that people would like to bring up now or other issues, that would be... Good. So, 
Any other technical issues we're going to cover right now? And let's imagine we want to finish the call, I guess, within... We had a two-hour slot, but I think an hour, an hour is usually enough for these things, uh, unless we end up going on and on. So what other technical discussion would people like to raise now? And you can raise your hand in the WebEx chat or just yell. This is, <clears throat> this is Jim. Um, one thing that's maybe a little bit orthogonal to all of this that's been kind of a um, um, sore point with uh, 3552 for me is that people put normative requirements in there. Uh, I would like the security requirements section to be just descriptive of the protocol that was previously described and um, not try and put normative requirements in there just because I'm afraid that they're going to be missed. So just to recap, you'd like you'd like documents not to have security considerations that have have, have 2019 like 2119's language in them. I mean that that's no my, 2119, that's my, no 2119 yeah, language in the security considerations. So I think that's absolutely right, but I fear we have to have the ISG do that work. <laughs> yeah, I, I also suspect that opinions might be all over the place on that one. Um, but yeah, that that would definitely be something for you know. That's definitely an IETF and not a kind of an architecturally type thing. So, uh, yeah, just, just that for, just for that whatever it's worth, 35, I, go ahead. Just if we're doing a 3552 BIS, that um, uh, I would like that to be in there. That's all. Well, I certainly agree with your sentiment. Uh, I, uh, at least personally, uh, but I, I, I also agree with Stephen that this is probably outside our, our scope. We could deliver some suggested text for one technical thing for for the ITF. Uh, if the ITF wants to update uh, a full RFC and take care of all all issues, then that's that seems like a, another task. We're really interested in this technical aspect here. Fair enough. Okay, so asking asking is kind of the same questions I asked last time in, in a different way. Um, is there anything here that's, that you know, is there anything that if you look at the set of drafts that people have written, um, it, ours and other, and the other ones, is there anything that's totally missing that really should be considered? Like just, you know, we don't say. I don't think anybody says much about routing, for example. Well, I do recall, Stephen. At one point, we were going to declare bankruptcy on routing security. Is that still on the table? <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's going to do the liquidation? That's my question. No, Steve, Steve was going to write it. I think Steve was going to write documents saying everything is terrible. We're not going to fix it. Um, I think. Right. I think one of the things that that is probably in the category of the people who know this know it very well, but the people who don't know this don't realize it's common, is that there's, it's very, very common right now for there to be more than one routing plane involved. Um, not just that the, there's MPLS encapsulating your IP, but the uh, service function chaining has kind of radically altered how flows travel in a lot of situations. Um, and I don't think that has a bunch of implications for uh, the ComSec, but it does mean that if if you have any illusions uh, that something about your path selection is protecting you from anything, you you are almost certainly wrong, because your visibility into the path selection is almost certainly limited to one of those routing plans. I, I don't think that's that, that seems like a good. Sorry. Go ahead. That seems like a good example of like something that'd be really good to like explain, but people don't really know. Yeah, so it's it's something I think, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about routing security, part of the problem is how do you work out what's the interaction among the routing security at sort of service function chaining levels and at MPLS or, or IP layers. 
um, because the interactions among them are controlled by different parties. And often the person who manages the service function chaining doesn't have any control over the, uh, the IP routing, as an example, uh, or vice versa. So there, there's definitely a, a set of things, you know, there's a bunch of people who are involved in this who know this really well, but then there's a bunch of people who are like, wait, what? Um, and I, if I see something that would be useful to write up here, or if I can come up with the time to do it, uh, that's something I might try and contribute. Ted, I agree with everything you said, um, but it's also often the case, depending on what the motivation of the attacker is, that they don't want to mess with the routing system because they need it to work to exfil the data. Um, I think in this field in general, we try to differentiate between misrouting, interference with routing, et cetera, et cetera, and gaming the routing protocols themselves. And I think um, some of the current work is the latter and is um, service chaining is not part of the threat there. Uh, just to confirm my understanding, you're, you're saying that you don't think that service chaining is being gamed in the way other parts of the routing is? Is that what you meant? The protocols being used are not being gamed. Part of, um, let's try it from the task level, um, part of what we would ask of a protocol is protection against it being gamed in a service chaining situation. Though I fear I'm de descending to a thousand meters. I don't want to really get into details, but all I'm saying is differentiate between misusing the protocol and the protocol itself having a problem that's being attacked. But I agree with uh, whoever said routing's fucked. Yeah, that's one of the things that is. Um, <laughs> but I, I think we can agree very easily that the, the high the attack surface for, for this routing type things has increased significantly. So previously we had essentially one or a couple uh, secure systems, and now we have many. Um, and uh, and they're also differentiated in different ways and in, in the control of other parties. So so the surface has uh, increased both in terms of what layer it is and what technical part, but also in terms of, you know, whose hands it is, it is in and so on. Um, and Comsec, of course, protects some of the, against some of this, but not, not entirely. So this kind of comes back to a question I put in the chat a little earlier, um, which is whether, I mean, up, up until now, a lot of the discussion has been about endpoints um, and, and untrustworthy endpoints. Um, and this, this is more about untrustworthy intermediate points, isn't it? And therefore, whether you can build a trustworthy service if for the sake of argument, you trust the endpoints, but you don't trust any of the points in between. Sorry, that wasn't a question. So the question would be, does that mean that um, intermediary node um, trustworthiness is in scope for what we're doing here? seems to be covered by existing things to a large extent i i i guess because because comsec and um because uh denial of service we we knew that that's a possibility um of course the i mean this is an interesting case of an intermediary it's not like your typical or firewall but it's just that for infrastructure is more complex and uh, error prone today than it was perhaps in the past um, and does that cover Randy's uh, entities that, that game the system, routing system? So 
then you're not necessarily talking about um, changing the functionality of the, of, of the intermediary nodes. So I mean, a, a, a kind of um, analogy for this is the, the guys who recently put 50 uh, mobile handsets into a, into a kid's handcart and wheeled them down a street and the resulting um, traffic managed to persuade Google Maps that there must be a, a traffic jam on that street. So they haven't changed the functionality of the network, but they've gained they've gamed the system so that it produces a um, a result that was unhelpful, um, untrustworthy. That's an example of the kind of IoT attack that actually attacks the physical aspect of something, and in, in this case, the the location of of the device, which is thought to be in the pocket of somebody driving a car and re in reality is uh, in, in that cart. And there are lots of attacks that, that can be made on the physical side of things that have interesting consequences. Yeah. With, yeah, I'm, with I'm, respect, I'm not, sorry, go ahead. With, with respect to intermediate nodes, um, I mean, we often deal with that uh, by doing end-to-end -end encryption and, and so forth, but there's also the problem that there are times when the intermediate nodes need to operate on some of the metadata, and we might be concerned about exploit of the of the metadata as well as the, the communication itself. Yeah, and there's the issue like the, I guess one of the questions was if, you know, if this is, you know, too far out of this endpoint uh, range uh, for for our scope. Um, and there is some linkage though, because if, if you can fool some of the underlying infrastructure to do some things that lets you, uh, you elevate yourself um, in, in some sense, get uh, security credentials uh, that, uh, make it look like you are, are the endpoint, and that's a problem. And I, I guess there are some situations where that might actually happen. Um, so, so, so in that sense, the, this, some of these attacks do translate to endpoint uh, concerns as well, but I'm not sure they're very different from, from other concerns with endpoints that you could also have a virus and therefore your, your thing might, might not actually work the way that you were expecting it to work. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, Yari, another thought about that is I, I noticed in some of the working groups, there's um, quite a lot of relatively recent attention being paid to um, information centric networking and or trusted content networks, um, where there's more processing going on at the nodes uh, to, for example, um, build a reputation profile for a particular route or a particular node in a route, um, sorry, route. Um, so, so looking at this the other way around, one approach of this group might be to look at the the, the risk assessment or the, the the requirements expression by those trusted networking or trusted content networking groups. Sorry, information centric or trusted content networking groups to see whether we think their requirements analysis and risk assessment make sense, um, and whether they're covering things that we hadn't thought of, or whether we've thought of things they're not covering. I guess we could ask Dirk. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of a useful answer. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, Robin, I, I think these are really interesting um, questions. Um, so, for example, also the um, maybe so there, there, there are two things. So, one is um, um, so if you had a more, say, empowered forwarding model. Um, what would that uh, change in the relationship of uh, endpoints and, and networks? Um, and then the other question, uh, what are the also potential additional risk that you introduce? But um, honestly, I think this is um, way beyond the scope of, of um, this discussion here. And then there are many interesting research questions, but uh, probably that, that would uh, mean a much longer running IAB program. Um, I'm not sure we should go into this here. Absolutely, yeah, I guess. No, certainly not suggesting yeah. we should do that research, but um, perhaps look at that research and see whether it indicates that we are missing something or that they're missing something. Yeah, 
Um, I think it's useful for us to look at things in, in the sense of like if if we are missing something. But I also hope that like if we do some general work on you know what kinds of things should we consider in designing protocols, and that we are not in charge of applying that to every working group. That that should be the working groups ask. Hopefully, right. Um, the principle that seems to me to crop up again and again is. Um, if you if you change something about the way the network works, so for instance, if you place more reliance on um, information centric networking nodes, for instance, um, do you open up new ways in which the the network infrastructure can be gamed, and are you therefore changing the basis on which you trust the way that the network behaves? Possibly yes, and um, on the other hand, um, well, there, there's there's basically this um, uh, trade-off in a sense that um, if you um, empower the network to do more useful things, that will also mean potentially you have you um, are relying less on overlay functionality, which. Uh, and some people's um, thinking is also say one of the problems uh, in the in the third discussion um, these days. On the other hand, uh, well, if you have more functionality, you also probably um, need to have more information, more mm -hmm. say visibility into some yeah, metadata or something, and this could again lead to other threats. So, um, but it's it's a you know, it's a longer discussion. Uh, so I started actually uh, writing up something uh, in this direction. It's not. Um, yeah, very mature yet. Um, that's why I, I didn't raise my hand early, uh, earlier. Uh, it may take some some more time. But thanks for for bringing this up. Yes. That's fine. It's it feels like there's a there's a general principle hovering around there of which what you describe is um, some of the examples. So I'll, I'll see if I can express it more clearly. Um, in, not on the call. <laughs> Okay, yeah. good. I guess uh, unless people have any specific issues about the draft that Yari and I put out, um, or I'm not sure if any of the other ones were updated. Um, uh, Dominic, I don't think your draft is updated, but I think one of the class ones was. Is that correct? Yeah. So I'm working on mine, and the uh, class one, the Arno Tadai's one, was updated. Okay, uh, it'd be great if you maybe set a pointer to the list. Uh, um, just sure. yeah, that'd be good. Um, I, I, so I only have two other questions to kind of focus with. Um, one is to uh, a very brief one: as to, if we're meeting in in Vancouver, would we like sixty or ninety minutes? Um, I'm assuming sixty might be okay, but if people would rather a slightly longer, that then please say so. Uh, and then the second question is to uh, just a, a longer one, I guess, that we can think about maybe rather than answer here is to what extent do we think covering privacy as well as security is uh, in scope or to what extent should we be working on that in, as part of this group as opposed to in general? I'd be interested in opinions on that second thing. I think you have enough energy here that an hour and a half makes sense. Okay, I'll update the session request for 90 minutes then. Uh, and then on the question of privacy, and then we'll get to any other business if people have any other things. So to what extent do we think that this activity should focus on privacy in IETF protocols? I, I'll go back and repeat my earlier statement. I think it's actually a good idea, but I'd I'd try and take it off as a, as a second hunk or a later hunk because you'll spin for too long without anything if you if you try and take on everything. Yeah, I, th I think in I tend to agree with Wes on that one. Um, having um, beaten my head against the privacy problem for a number of years now. 
I, I think if you if you approach the first piece of work with with one eye on the security aspects of it, on and the other eye on a slightly more generic um, trust aspect of it, um, then I think that would lay the foundations for privacy work later on. So, for instance, just you know, very generically, if you trust an intermediate an intermediate node not to exfiltrate data inappropriately, um, then that's that's a that's a trust factor you can document. You don't have to get into the privacy ramifications of um, of, of whether that's trustworthy or not, um, but you could later on. Hi, uh, this is Ali. Um, uh, I think uh, when we talk about privacy, it's a uh, huge scope, but I think uh, what would be significant for protocol designers is to be aware of threats to privacy and that when they design protocols, they should be conservative in collecting data and minimizing the exposure. That's the kind of uh, general guidance, uh, which I think is referred to already in the existing text, but uh, we could try to emphasize that uh, without going into the trust uh, topics too much, uh, specifically for protocol designers, because a lot of things are uh, a lot of privacy issues are arising because uh, uh, data is liberally collected, which is not absolutely needed, often as a side effect of protocol design. Maybe we can uh, focus on that area. So you mean uh, it should be conservative in the opportunity to collect data because the, the protocols themselves don't collect data. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, they shouldn't uh, lead, uh, let's say, to uh, that kind of uh, side effect. Okay, and I, I, I take the point about phasing and scheduling and not trying to bite off too much. Um, I, it might be worth if people were, if uh, had another look back at RFC 6973 and see, you know, is there, is there stuff that isn't in there that's worth considering or that might be worth kind of promoting into the IETF as a BCP or something like that. Um, but just that, you know, RFD 6973 has, is already an IAB output along some of those lines already. So, so there, has, there is some previous work to base on. Uh, so I, I, I think that kind of touches on everything I think we can kind of get done today. We got some volunteers. We have the uh, ID cutoff date is March 9th as a reminder. So it'd be really good to get that if people uh, if we have a 90 minute session in uh, vancouver just if anybody wants to kind of suggest a, a slot at that then uh just send mail to the list um and then i guess we're at any other business so any other business anybody wants to raise Sounds like not. In that case, okay, please, you know, update stuff, post to the mailing list, and uh, we'll talk on the mailing list and then arrange a session in Vancouver. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. So, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Um, Thank you.